Hi, I'm Sam Kaufman, and today I want to talk a little bit about a couple of plants, a couple of medicinal plants that I use a lot. Um, I use them with personal clients. We use them at the school, in our school clinic, a lot, and they are part of our, generally part, a big part of our Materia Medica, or the herbs that we use in our student, in our, in our course, the Herbal Medic course. And so this, with this class, what I'll do here is I'm going to get behind the camera and I'll show you a lot of these, these I'll show you these plants, some close-ups, and talk all about them and how we use them medicinally. I'll probably put a short and abridged copy of this out on YouTube, but the full version will go on to my online class. I have a full online course uh, that covers the, the topics, that covers the curriculum of the Herbal Medic Level 1, the basic version, the basic version of it, which is about 70 class hours, and, uh, and, and this is meant for that, the, the full version is meant for that course, actually. All right, so let's get behind the camera and uh, and talk a little bit about both of these plants. All right, so let's start right off with our Oregon grape. So I'm just going to kind of get a back a picture of the whole plant, the Oregon grape here. Um, if you can if you can see that, it's fairly it's about a waist high shrub here in my own personal garden. It is something that you would see up to you know 15 feet high sometimes, and depending on where it grows. Usually the Oregon grape, this particular species, which is the the uh, Mahonia or the uh, Berberis. Uh, aquafolium you'll find uh, it grows higher and it usually grows more around you know you find it usually below 4,000 feet or so but I, you know it grows in the city like in Denver certainly I've seen it lots growing in gardens there and it's you know that's up above four or five thousand feet so you'll see it in, in, there in in elevations around there and lower um, as opposed to ones that grow at higher elevations that are using more of a ground cover uh, particular species there's many species of this particular genus but uh, and and they're all fairly interchangeable medicinally but the one that I'm going to talk about here and specifically the one that most people mean when they say organ grape is the actual berberis aquafolium which used to be again it used to be called mahonia aquafolium you can still say interchangeably you can say mahonia aquafolium as the genus uh, you know, if you, if you want, and people will know what you're talking about generally. So we'll look at the leaves here, which are actually leaflets, and if we look at them, we'll see that they are um, alternate. The the actual leaflets themselves are these sort of spiny, um, almost holly-looking kind of leaves. You know, that are leaflets, and we can see that they're used, they're an odd number. So they'll have anywhere between five and you know even up to eleven. Sometimes you'll see uh, leaflets. So we can count these out, and you can see that we've got. You know, leaflets of two, four, six, eight, nine on this particular one here. And so that's what we'll see. The, the leaves are, are a little, or the leaflets themselves are a little more thin than you would find with it with a holly. And then uh, down here I see some berries. The flowers here are yellow. Now the flowers have already fallen off, but I'm going to look down here and you can see some of the grapes, some of the, the that are still left that haven't fallen or been eaten uh, by birds. And the flowers are yellow with six petals, um, six stamens, six sepals. Uh, and so that's that's one identifying feature when you see the flowers, but it's only in the you know in the early spring that we get the flowers here in in central Texas, and this is really not a natural, a native so much to this area. You you probably could find it, but I this is actually planted. I, I transplanted this from somewhere else and have nursed it along. It doesn't grow really well in this kind of alkaline limestone soil that we have here, but with some babying and uh, and a bit of, of nutrients, a lot of our you know natural compost which you use here and, and just kind of the forest garden environment, it's actually started to do really well but I've been babing it for a few years uh, so this is uh, this is something that we use all both the the roots we can use the stems we can use the leaves we can use the berries and we can use the flowers uh, some of them for specifically medicinally some of them edibly and uh, and and even for flavor so let me go through that and this is going to echo a little bit what I'm going to talk about with the algorita because it's very similar in, in many respects but there are definitely some differences as well all right, so let's start with the root of Oregon grape. And just to kind of compare and contrast, I have a picture up here of both Algarita and Oregon grape side by side. So on the left, we have Algarita, Berberis trifoliolata. And on the right hand we side of this picture, you see Oregon grape or Berberis aquifolium. Now, the Oregon grape is actually not a picture of the root. It's a picture of the lower stem that I harvested from my own. This is something I've harvested from my own plant. And it is, uh, with Oregon grape, the nice thing about it is you can harvest the stems and they're very effective. They work just as well as the root. With Algarita on the left there, that's not so much the case. If I were to take a picture of the same length of stem on the Algarita, you would see that it would be dark yellow on one end, the closest to the root, but as it got higher and higher on the stem, it would get a much lighter yellow. It's not nearly as effective. 
the stem loses its effectiveness on, on algorita. And for that reason, algorita is better to harvest the root. The nice thing about algorita and, and the root harvesting, and I'll get to this later in the, in the video here, is that you can actually harvest the root without necessarily killing the plant, depending on how big the plant is. But organ grape is what we're talking about here. So we start with the root. The root is really used primarily uh, by myself for issues of what we would call blood cleansing or issues where we want to actually stimulate liver uh, activity. So it's what we would call a colagog. In other words, it can help cause a cascade of events that increases our digestive, uh, our digestive enzymes that are released both through the gallbladder as well as the pancreas. It helps digestion of fats and meats in that way. But beyond just that, a lot of times we get uh, portal vein hypertension. We get, we, we get food and other foodstuffs that are coming through the portal vein into the liver, causing problems and backing up, even just slightly, the liver's ability to deal with waste products. And this can be because of a poor diet chronically over time. This can be lifestyle issues. This can be being overweight. And so what, what um, Oregon Grape does is it helps us to, it helps stimulate the liver to work a, a more efficiently. It helps stimulate the liver to help clean the blood. So this is a classic herbalism contact or herbalism phrase, blood cleanser, that doesn't really make sense in a Western pharmaceutical, orthodox kind of pharmaceutical-based medicine, but it makes a lot of sense in terms of what, how this herb helps us in, in terms of herbalism. Now, this can help with a lot of different things, everything from small intestinal bacteria overgrowth and, and leaky gut syndrome to, uh, to the, you know, IBS, the classic, uh, you know, kind of Western orthodox uh, um, diagnosis that basically means I don't have any idea what you really have going on there in your gut. We often call it IBS to um, uh, uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease, so if reflux uh, to um, issues with digestion, just general issues with digestion uh, itself, you know, um, whether it's flatulence and bloating and, and the kinds of things that, that accompany some of those issues I just mentioned, all the way to issues that might be, uh, um, they might be manifesting themselves on the surface of the skin. And then that, I mean, mean things like, like acne or eczema, things that are related to actually poor digestion at the, at the root of the problem. So, uh, so a lot of times, uh, organ grape is very useful as sort of a detox for people who have issues that are, that are playing themselves out on the skin. Another area that that plays itself out on is actually the lymph. So the organ grape can be used in conjunction with other lymph movers to help move the lymph system, help move the, the immune system. So it's, a, it's also very antibacterial, and it can be used for the mucosa anywhere in the body in that regard when you take it internally. So it's useful for things like uh, something even in the upper respiratory, like, for instance, a, a strep throat, all the way to uh, urinary tract infection on the other end of the, of the body. Um, it is milder than some of the more strong, what I would say, strong berberine-containing herbs, which would be algorita and even golden seal. And yet it is also very useful in infections, uh, in general infections like of that type. Now, it also contains, in terms of infection and anti-infectiveness, it contains a constituent called MHC, which is 5 prime uh, That is a, that is a, um, a, uh, um, a, basically a, molecular compound that disables the certain bacteria's ability to defend itself and most notably that's found with in, in bacteria like MRSA like uh, um, methicillin uh, resistant uh, staph aureus so we find it useful for staph infections probably useful for strep infection well definitely useful for strep infection specifically for strep throat I've used it that way clinically it's very it's worked very well in that regard um, you like to you you generally want to get it to the tissue though not just taking it internally but actually getting it to the tissue we'll talk about that in a second um, because of the the MHC it's useful as what we would call a synergistic or adjuvant herb along with other antibacterial herbs now not just the root has MHC in it the leaf does as well and I use the leaf in that regard also. So uh, working from the root all the way up to the leaf, the leaf um, I dry and powder and use that in wound powders. The root can be done the same thing. You can, you can dry it and use it in a wound powder. You can tincture it. I prefer to tincture it if I'm going to take it internally. And I like to tincture it fresh. It works very well that way. It, uh, you tincture it in about 30% or 40% alcohol is fine. The berberine is very much water soluble. So you don't need to have a high percentage of alcohol for it. Um, I generally work with it also for uh, for any kind of a a, a detox 
um, type of, of situation that could, that could play itself out in a number of ways, uh, such as for, for females, for women, it can be PMS issues that are related to digestion and uh, congestion as well. Uh, the liver, we find, you know, is a very potent or very, I'm sorry, very uh, important uh, um, you know, uh, obviously organ, organ system and touches so many other organ systems throughout our body. So it's really important to understand that anything that you do, and, and normally if I'm doing something where I'm doing a lymph cleanse or a le or immune stimulant or, uh, or even a urinary tract infection type of, type of formula, that I almost always also support the liver. Because aside from the digestive issues, you know, of course, the liver balances our blood sugar. The liver is important for, for, for detoxing and, and in doing so, uh, promoting cellular health or health at a, very, at a cellular level throughout our body. And so we find that herbs like Oregon grape really help us with that, uh, with, with that kind of a, of a support. Okay. So um, uh, back to, so that's, that's more or less, I would say, most of what I use the, the root for. The leaves, as I mentioned, I dry them and use them in a wound powder. They work well for that way. The leaf is also useful for kidney uh, support. I've used it that way for, for urinary tract and kidney support, especially upper urinary tract infections. Um, it, uh, the leaf is also a bitter to some extent and helps stimulate digestion. And so in that regard, you know, uh, bitters are things that we use. Now, now the root I mentioned earlier, I, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but the root is, is very bitter because of the berberine, but it's not nearly as bitter as algarita is actually. As bitter as it is, it, it could be much worse. Um, the, the flowers, much like the algarita, they're very similar in the sense that they're very flavorful and useful for, 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 for marinating or for flavor in, in marinating uh, you know, type stews. I've, I've used the flowers of both these plants in marinades for venison, and, and they're just wonderful. The berries of the organ grape could be made into jam or jelly, same as algarita. Uh, they're, they are a different color. They're more of a grape color, you know, the, of course, the purple when they're ripe, as opposed to algarita is red. But they are uh, very, very delicious. And I used to eat them actually raw when I, would, uh, when I did a lot of primitive skills type stuff in the mountains. And that was more probably from the uh, Mahonia or the uh, Berberis repens that grows more closer to the ground in the mountains, but the grapes were very potent and very nutritionally uh, concentrated. A lot of, a lot of uh, nutritional density in those grapes. So they're very much a, a great edible as well. So this is, these are some of the main things I use for the organ grape. Now let's talk a little bit about the algarita root. All right, so this is our algarita plant. This is our Berberis trifoliolata. Uh, this, and, it, and again, algarita, agarito, agarita, desert barberry. It's got a number of different names. So the whole plant, as you can see, is kind of a spiky bush that grows. It likes sunny areas here. This one's growing in the shade. Most of the ones in my yard actually are growing in the shade, but uh, that's just kind of where they've come up. And you'll find them growing along fence lines and in the shade under because because I believe more than anything the seeds are spread by birds. Uh, there's a lot of different birds that like these uh, these these berries, and what they'll do is eat them, of course, and then poop them out, and that's where they'll end up growing. So usually behind or underneath, rather, uh, uh, different bird perch areas is where you'll find them. Now in the shady areas, they will grow, but they don't usually grow as quickly or as well. So uh, so that's what we're looking at right here. But let me get a close-up of kind of a leaf here. I don't have any to show you the berries on. The berries have already come and gone for the spring, but this gives you an idea of the, of the spiky leaves. Now, so trifoliolata telling you these are leaflets of three. So these are these here are simple leaves, but they but they're actually of three. So if you can you can see as we get down into here specifically what I'm talking about there. And then again, sort of like the like the uh, also like the Oregon grape, we have these spiky leaflets that usually have an odd number of spikes as well. Well, they always have an odd number of spikes, but usually it's five. Sometimes it can be seven, depending on the size of the leaf. Okay, and then leaflets of three if that gives you a good idea. So this is again another plant that we can use similar to the uh, Oregon grape. We're using the root. We're using, you can use the stem. It's not nearly as uh, profound medicinally as the as the root is, unlike Oregon grape where they're, they're fairly interchangeable. Uh, and we can use the leaf medicinally as well. And we can use the berry uh, edibly. We use, uh, use it for um, uh, jams and jellies. And then we can also use the flower petals also. So I'll go through all of that uh, as well and talk a little bit more in depth about the medicinal uses of the algarita. The algarita root also very similar in terms of it's, it's a bitter, it's an antibacterial bitter for the gut. The same way uh, helps stimulate the liver uh, the same way as organ grape. But I don't really use it for things like skin 
and and as a blood cleanser as much as I use it for just straight up gut infections, bacterial gut infections uh, and, and protozoal gut infections so it can be used uh, in support as a formula with other herbs for things like Giardia, Cryptosporidium, um, any kind of bacterial gut infection, anything from cholera, you know, something serious like cholera, even salmonella, uh, you know, gram positive, gram negative gut infections. Uh, and again, not only by, not always by itself, but certainly is part of other herbs in there. Now, I've used it, we, we kind of use it as our go-to herb. Our first herb of choice generally in terms of, of infections that you get when you are gastroenteritis that you get in, in a lot of times in Central America or Mexico. So when we go down to Nicaragua with the herbal medics, uh, Algarita is one of the many herbs that we take. And Algarita is usually one of the first ones that most students use uh, right off the bat. If they, you know, you get that feeling when you, if you've ever had this, if you've traveled to Mexico or Central America or any foreign country, but you see this a lot in Central America, if you, you drink some water that's bad and you start to get that feeling in your gut and you just, you know that you're, that you're not, something's not right. You're not really sick, full on sick yet, but you know in a matter of hours that you're probably going to be sick. And uh, that's that's the point where you start taking algarita. You usually find that it that it counteracts, helps that uh, helps greatly with those kinds of infections, All, as an astringent on the gut mucosa, as well as of course being antibacterial, uh, very good for anything in the gut. And that can include even things in uh, you know anywhere in the alimentary canal, from the mucosa of the mouth all the way to the other end. So. Anything that needs an astringent in it, and that could be hemorrhoids on the one end, on the other end. That could be um, um, canker sores and and mouth sores and problems in the in the mouth. It can be strep throat again. Again, we need to get it to the tissue though. We can't just take it internally. One of the things about berberine, even though it's a very good antibacterial, is it doesn't cross the the gut mucosa very well, the brush border. It doesn't get across into the bloodstream very well. So if we're going to take it for something, if we want to use it for something that's outside of the gut, we generally need to get it directly onto that tissue. And that means, for instance, in the case of, say, strep throat, if you're putting it on there, you need to spray it or gargle it or get it onto that tissue somehow, that mucosa somehow. Very important. Now, Anything that contains berberine generally contains MHC, which I talked about earlier. Uh, the leaves of the algarita plant also contain MHC. So I use them in conjunction with the root because they help the effectiveness of the root. So I mentioned earlier what MHC does. It helps break down or helps keep certain types of bacteria from defending themselves very well. And so what we find that if we use MHC along with berberine, so we use the leaf along with the root, for instance, then we find that the effectiveness of berberine goes up exponentially, up to as much as 16 times according to some of the research that's out there. 16 times as effective in, in killing bacteria. It's not, a, berberine is, is a good anti, good antibacterial, but it's not, not great, it's not amazing, but if you mix the MHC with it, then you find its effectiveness goes up greatly, and it doesn't even take that much MHC to do the job. So I find myself using the leaf a lot in conjunction with the root for that reason. The leaf, however, by itself, I also use as an anti-nauseal, a very good anti-nauseal. Um, it is something that would work uh, for, for things like motion sickness, for things like uh, AMS or altitude mountain sickness. Um, it's, it's, say, it's pregnancy safe, so it would work for, for morning sickness. It works for uh, anxiety type of to illness or hangover, you know, type of type of sickness. Any of those things, you'll find the leaf works very well for. We can tincture the leaf, and that's what I usually do. Uh, also, in 30 to 40 percent alcohol, we tincture the root the same way, 30 to 40 percent alcohol, in, and uh, that's that's my preferred method of taking it. Uh, it, you could certainly, I dry the leaf as well, and you can take the dry leaf, dry it and grind it and put it into wound powder because of the MHC again will help with, uh, with dealing with infections of staph or strep type on your, on your arm or on your leg or somewhere on an extremity. And usually those are the first, um, those are the first types of bacteria that you find in an infected wound. So it's helpful that way as well. The berries of the algorithm are actually a dark red, and you can turn those into a jam or a jelly. They're delicious. They're kind of like a rhubarb almost, and one of my favorite jam my favorite types of jams, honestly. The flowers are also edible and very, very much a good uh, flavoring for, again, for, for things, things like venison stew and, and, and for marinades. So there's a lot that we can use both of these, both of these herbs for, and it really helps to kind of look at them both back and forth, uh, you know, back as we as we go. All right, well, that's been an overview and kind of even a compare and contrast of these two plants that are in the same family, the Berberidaceae family. They're also the same genus, the Berberis genus, and they have a lot of similarities. 
as well as differences, both subtle and not so subtle in terms of how we use them medicinally. I realize this was kind of a high-level overview. We didn't delve into a lot of detail about it, and yet I uh, hopefully it's enough to kind of get you get you an idea, get you started in understanding more about these plants. Now, I would say in closing that these are both very important plants for my own personal apothecary, and and that is both in in my in terms of my clinic, the student clinic that we run, as well as my own personal clientele, as well as just at home for my own first day for for my love for a family you know for loved ones and so I would highly recommend at a minimum the Oregon grape become one of your uh, go-to herbs as well I would put it both of those herbs in my top 20 uh, herbs that I think are most important to have around for a variety of reasons now the algorita is going to be a little bit harder to find you're not going to find that online but feel free to uh, contact me if you're interested I can always come up with a way to get you some algorita it, it is very prolific in this area and you can reach me at sam at thehumanpath.com for those of you not already in, uh, familiar with my online class or in my online class that are that are seeing this video, um, my online class can be uh, re reached by looking at uh, thehumanpath.com, and and there's a, um, a picture on the right hand side. There should be a, an ad on the right hand side that'll take you to more information. This is the basic online course, which is about 70 hours online and uh, is a basic. We have a total of 524 hour between the basic and the intermediate course, but the basic gives you some really good thorough uh, baseline kind of information, a structure to work with and, and to work from. And this is just a small uh, kind of sample of that type of information as well. Thanks very much for watching and until next time, this has been Sam Kaufman. Goodbye.